I'm also, guys, going to tell you again, if you have these still, hopefully you do, pull them back out. Um, because now we're going to get into our four AGI deductions, okay? And we're going to get into itemized deductions, which are on our Schedule A. For study purposes, guys, I think these are great tools. I would mark them up. I would make my little notations, you know, write in dollar limitations, write in, you know, percentage limitations, whatever is going to help you retain this information. Because again, every rule is different. So I would mark these up um, to your advantage, however you want, however it will help you you know, remember the information for the exam. I also think kind of going back to these guys time and again is very helpful because it under helps you understand how information flows, okay, within the forms and where things need to be reported. Um, it helps you understand what is for AGI, what is, you know, from AGI, like that. Again, we're not done with that tax formula. You guys still need to kind of know that tax formula going well, and if the exam was any indication, didn't go over so well. So I'm telling you, we're not done with that formula. So if you didn't get it on the first exam, you want to know it for the second exam, okay? Um, again, my two cents, but. Um, okay, guys, so we are going into deductions, okay? And unlike gross income, guys, where we said everything that makes you wealthier is gross income, unless you can point me to a provision that tells me you don't have to put it on your tax return, Okay, deductions are the opposite. You cannot take a deduction. You cannot take a deduction unless you can point me to a provision that says you can. Okay, so it's the opposite now. And they are referred to as a matter of legislative grace. These are not things Congress has to give you, but they do for varied reasons. Okay, to provide equity, to encourage certain behaviors. They want you to have certain deductions. Um, Okay, you guys know by now that there's generally two types of deductions, okay, for AGI deductions and are from AGI deductions. And there's two parts to those from AGI deductions. There's the standard slash itemized and then there's our personal exemption. Um, guys, in general, if you can get a four AGI deduction, you want a four AGI above the line deduction for two reasons. Number one, they're generally not limited, okay? If you have a deduction and expense and it's a four AGI deduction, you generally can take it in full, whereas we will learn very soon that most of our below the line itemized deductions are gonna be restricted. There's a lot of limitations on them, okay? So typically, if you can take it four AGI, you wanna take it up above the line. The other reason is this, is the more four AGI deductions you have, the more you push down your AGI, okay? And when again, when it comes to taking those below the line deductions, the lower that AGI, the more successful you're gonna be at being able to claim those below the line deductions. Now I know that's a whole lot of words, but it will make sense as we get into the itemized deductions. But the idea is you wanna drive down your AGI as much as you can, because you're gonna be much better off being able to succeed at taking these itemized deductions, because a lot of those below the line deductions, again, rely on calculations that involve your filing status and the percentage of your AGI. So the lower it is, the better off you're gonna be, okay? Um, the book goes about, we're gonna look at four AGI deductions now. The book kind of goes about it, um, sorting it into three sort of um, types of deductions that are for AGI. They refer to them as uh, deductions directly related to your business, uh, deductions indirectly related to your business, and then there's sort of a catch-all category and all other. Um, I don't really care, it doesn't really matter to me that you guys know them as that, as long as you know them. Um, but if it helps you remember them, then that's fine, okay? Um, what I will say is that it's helpful to understand the nature of a transaction that a taxpayer is engaging in, okay? You wanna know, is it a trade or business transaction? Is it an investment transaction? Is it personal? And this is because, guys, it'll help you figure out generally where to report it, okay? Trade or business deductions are generally taken up above the line, okay? Whereas your investment <laughs> your investment and your um, personal deductions are generally gonna be below the line on your Schedule A, your itemized deduction schedule, okay? Um, the code sort of breaks in deductions into two categories. They have your for-profit transactions and then your not transactions you're not entering into with a profit motive in mind, okay? The ones you're not entering into with a profit motive in mind, guys, those are really gonna be your personal deductions, and those are gonna be itemized deductions on your Schedule A. Now your for-profit items, you have to look a little closer at, okay? 
because these are going to be either trade or business or investment. Okay, we'll lump them into an investment category. Again, trade or business are going to be up above the line, more beneficial. Whereas if it's investment, it's probably going to be a itemized deduction. And really what you're looking at here, guys, is there's rules that say if you're involved in the activity on a regular, continual, and material basis, okay, it's trade or business. Whereas if you're not, it's probably investment. So, you know, the best example I can think of is, you know, people often, like, you know, buy stocks and they like to trade them and they have their own little Charles Schwab account or whatever. Um, you know, you may do it on the weekend, you may do it at night a little bit, um, okay? That really is gonna be investment, guys. Whereas, you know, someone who maybe doesn't work for an employer or a company, but he could be a day trader at home, you know, trading his own money, his own stocks. And if this is something he's doing Monday through Friday year-round, well, that's gonna be an, a, a trader business, okay? Because he's doing it on a regular, continual, and material basis. So you really have to look and see, is it something you're doing occasionally? Is it something you're doing you know, on a pretty constant stream, okay? Um, okay, so I said trader business are gonna be up above the line. There is one exception the book points out. There's something called unreimbursed employee business expenses. Those are gonna be an itemized deduction. That's your one real exception to that trader business rule. On the flip side, you just said your investments are generally gonna be an itemized deduction. And the exception here is um, rental and royalty activities. Okay, those are always, without exception, treated up above the line. You're going to use those on a Schedule E. <laughs> uh, unreimbursed employee business expenses. It's below. it's below. That's the exception to the trader business. Because it's a direct business expense, but you actually will put it on the Schedule A. direct business expense they talk about and probably the most important for our purposes is, um, look, you might have um, activities you're engaging in, okay? And if they rise to the extent of being a trade or business, you are considered a tax nothing, okay? You haven't incorporated yourself, you're not part of a partnership, but you are engaging in activities on a very regular, continual, material basis, okay? Technically, you're considered a tax nothing but you still have to report these activities, and the rules say that you report them along with your personal activities on your 1040. Now you do this, guys, by using a Schedule C. Okay, so if you're thinking about your sole proprietor, your day trader, okay? He is gonna fill out a Schedule C with all of his business activities, and we're not gonna go too much into the Schedule C, but I want you to understand it a little bit, okay? Um, so he's gonna start out, guys. There's an income section on here up top, so he's gonna put down all of his forms of income. And then he's gonna deduct his expenses, okay? And the rules say here that he will be allowed to deduct, deduct his expenses if they're reasonable, ordinary, and necessary. And we'll look more at those definitions when we get into businesses later in the semester. But the IRS doesn't typically mess around with these too much, guys. Um, they generally let businesses deduct expenses as they see fit. Um, they're not gonna dictate what is reasonable or you know, for your business. Um, so as long as it's generally in line and not something outrageous, it's probably going to qualify. And the idea here is, guys, that typically if you have a business expense, it's going to be 100% deductible. Because in their eyes, you're incurring these expenses in order to generate that income. And since they're taxing you on that income, it's only fair to give you the deduction for those expenses, okay? So as far as businesses go, most of their expenses are going to be fully deductible. Now what I want to point out is they're calling it, okay, don't be misled, they're calling it a 4 AGI deduction. And there is a section on the front of your 1040 that says 4 AGI, okay? But guys, you're not going to see this trade or business anywhere over here. You're not going to deduct its expenses over here, literally under the 4 AGI section, okay? He's going to fill out his Schedule C, he's going to have his income, he's going to have his expenses, he's going to come up with a net profit, okay? That net profit carries over instead to line 12 on your 1040. If you go to line 12, it says business income attached schedule C, okay? That's his net profit. His, his expenses are in fact for AGI because they are happening up above the AGI line. But again, don't be misled. You're not gonna find them written right over here, clear as day, business expenses. It's all on a schedule C, the net profit carries over. Okay, I want you guys to understand that flow. And we're gonna come back to this a few times. Um, okay. The 
book then talks about the uh, red royalties guys, okay? Whether it's a trade or business, you're engaged in something full time or it's something you're doing on your part time, again, it's up above the line. It's very, very similar to that Schedule C that we're looking at, okay? Except for with rents and royalties, it's Schedule E, okay? And it pulls over to line, I think, 17. Yeah, rent royalties, C Schedule E. So in the case of rent or royalties, again, if it's trade or business or investment, it's up above the line, but you're not gonna see those expenses anywhere in this four AGI section, even though that's what they're saying, they're four AGI deductions. They are, they're happening up above the line, but they're not like plain as day on the front of the 1040 anywhere. Does anyone have any questions about what I'm trying to say here? I just wanna make sure you're getting the way the flow is working. Do you repeat where it comes from before the this, you said schedule? It'll be Schedule A, so this is rent and royalties. Okay, so it'll look very similar to the Schedule C, except for it'll be a Schedule E, and it'll be for rent and royalties. Again, they'll have income, they'll have their deductible expenses, they're gonna arrive at a net profit number. The net profit number pulls over to the 1040 on line 17. So it's very, it's very, very similar to Schedule C. I'm more concerned that you guys understand Schedule C than me, okay? And then we talked a bit about partnerships, guys. Partnerships pass through entities, so it could be LLC, it could be S Corporation, okay? I said there that, look, the partnership reports a 1065, that's their tax return, okay? But it's really an informational tax return, they're not paying taxes. Instead, they send you, the partners, K-1s, and you have to take that income, okay, so if it's interest income, and you have to mesh it with your own personal interest income and put it right on the face of your 1040. There's no separate schedule there, okay? If it's you know any other expenses, all those things are happening up above the line with a few exceptions. Okay, but for our purposes, again, you know all of the income, all of the expenses from any sort of pass-through entity are going to happen generally up above the line. They're for AGI. Okay, so that's why they're saying direct business expenses are for AGI deductions. Again, you're not going to see them on the front of this. Okay, you're going to see them probably on some separate form, but they are up above the line. Um, okay. Then they have indirect trader business expenses, guys, okay? And these types of expenses are things that really are inherently personal in nature, but the fact is, is you're probably incurring these expenses because of your business. So, you know, moving is the perfect example, guys. Moving expenses really are something personal in nature, okay? You're moving your personal goods, your family, your house, um, but let's face it, most of us are only moving most of the times for business reasons. You got a transfer, you're starting a different job, okay? So they recognize that you're incurring these expenses for work reasons, so they're gonna grant you some sort of deduction for them, okay? Now moving expenses, guys, have a bunch of different components, okay, and we're gonna break this down a little bit. Um, so the code knows, look, you're gonna move for probably work reasons, so they're gonna give you a deduction for qualified, moving expenses, okay? Not all of your moving expenses are gonna qualify. Some of them you're just gonna pay for out of pocket on your own. Uh, so now we're talking about qualified, okay? Now to be eligible for this deduction for your qualified moving expenses, there's two tests, okay? There's a distance test and there's a time test. And I know the distance test is written a little awkwardly in the book, so hopefully this will help, okay? The rules say, and I use that all the words. Look at it this way, okay? You want to look at where your old residence to your old place of work, okay? Where are you working today? Where are you living today? Let's just say roughly my commute right now is 42 miles, okay? And maybe you get a transfer um, and they're sending you someplace to a different office, okay? So now you have your new place of work. Okay, the rule says if it increases your current commute, okay, your old commute, by 50 miles, so now this becomes 93 miles or more, you'll qualify, okay? Look at your old commute, look at the new place they're sending you from your old residence. If it increases by at least 50 miles or more, of course, then you'll qualify for these deductions. So that means, okay, Fine. I can go ahead and you know move my family to a new residence, and my cost of doing that, my qualified cost of doing that, will in fact be deductible. If you don't hit that 50 
mile mark, um, it's not going to work. You can't take any deductions, right? It's not really any more complicated than that. Okay. Time. There's a time test in addition to the distance test. So you have to meet both, okay? It says if you're an employee, okay, you have to be employed on a full-time basis for 39 of the next 52 weeks after, okay, after the move, not before, after the move. So you can go ahead and move and you have to stay employed full-time. doesn't have to be with the same employer, okay? As long as you're employed full-time for at least 39 of the next 52 weeks immediately after the move, you've met the test. If you're self-employed, the rule says you have to um, be uh, work, be employed uh, 78 of the next 104 weeks, two years, okay? You have to be employed for 78 of the next 104 weeks. Okay? Guys, now chances are, when you have to go, it's time to file your tax return, you will not have met this 39 week rule definitely will not have met the 78 week rule, okay? You don't know yet whether or not you're really qualified that I meet those time tests. The rules say, look, go ahead, file your tax return, claim the deductions, the qualified moving expenses as deductions. That's okay. But if you fail the time test, sometime thereafter you file your tax return, you have one of two choices. You go back, you amend last year's return, okay? You take the deductions off and you refile. Alternately, what you can do is on your next tax return, if you fail the test, you take the amount of deductions that you took and maybe you shouldn't have because you failed the test, and you pull them into gross income on your next tax return. You took them as a deduction on the old one. This doesn't mean you reverse the deduction and kind of put a positive deduction. You pull it into gross income up above, okay? Okay, guys, you can move for a number of reasons, okay? Most likely, you got a transfer at work. You know, you were working in New York, they need you to go out to California, okay? That works. Um, it could be a situation where you just got a new job. You were working for one employer here in New York, now you're gonna go to work for a different employer in California. That works. It could be your first job, okay? That's fine, that works. It could be, you know what, I hate New York, I hate the winters here, I gotta get out of here, I wanna move to Florida. As long as you meet the tests, as long as you are employed 39 of the 52 weeks after the move, um, you'll be okay, okay? It doesn't really matter why you're moving so long as you meet the rules. You can move for any reason. Qualified moving expenses, okay? This is the big question. What is qualified, okay? Um, the first one is any sort of packing and transportation of your personal goods is qualifying. You can have your cars transported, your personal automobiles. You can have your pets transported, okay? That qualifies. They're family members. Um, look, I think you rent a U-Haul, you hire a professional mover, those are all good expenses, okay? They qualify for the deduction. Um, the public assignment said that the, uh, the mover added a $450 fee, is that, is that deductible? It will be deductible. Um, travel and lodging during the move, during the move itself, okay? On the way to California. That is deductible. So you need to stay in a hotel overnight, maybe you're driving your car, okay, you're staying in a hotel overnight, you can deduct that. Maybe I'm driving my car and my husband's following me out with the kids on a plane, their plane tickets will be deductible, okay? So travel on the way there is deductible. Lodging on the way there is deductible. Meals on the way there are not deductible, okay? They consider that personal. They won't pay for your meals during the Okay, um, and the guys, look, the cost of driving your cars, uh, the rates dropped a little bit from last year, it's 23 cents a mile. So if you have to drive your car across country, you get 23 cents a mile for that. Alternatively, you could track the actual costs of driving your car out there. You could figure out what my car payment is, how many, you know, how much gas did I spend, like that. But the general rule is you take 23 cents a mile for driving your car, okay? okay. Said. What's not qualifying is meals. Look, they won't pay for your meal on the way out, okay? House hunting costs. Usually you have to go out ahead of time. Maybe you fly out a few times. Maybe you drive there a few times to go check out houses, locations, things like that. Not deductible, okay? It's a personal expense. 
anything related to selling the property. You may take a loss on your house. You may have to fix a bunch of fix a bunch of stuff up before you move out. You may have to pay the broker, okay? None of this is deductible. Um, temporary housing. A lot of times they may move you and you can't find a house of your choice right away. They may put you up in some sort of house or hotel or whatever, not deductible. Okay. Then the question comes in, well, how do I report all of this? Look, guys, if you're moving on your own and there's really not an employer involved in the situation, um, they're not funding it in any way, well, you just deduct it, the qualified portion, okay? You just take it on your return as a 4 AGI deduction. Now, if an employer is involved, that's a different story, okay? Then it becomes, well, how are they handling it? Now, what I've seen most often is usually they just kind of hand you a lump sum of money. You know, we'll just tell, depending on the level of employee, here's $50,000 move yourself, move your family, I don't want to know anything else about it, okay? If they're just handing you a check, that's compensation, okay? You have to take that into gross income on your tax return. That 50 grand is gonna go in the gross income section under comp. And then, since you're paying for the expenses, you can deduct the qualified ones as for AGI deductions. The non-qualifying, they don't go on the tax return, okay? Alternatively, they could say, we'll reimburse your qualified moving expenses, okay? In that case, if they're reimbursing you, if you're showing them receipts and they're specifically dollar for dollar reimbursing you, okay, you have no gross income, you take no deduction, okay? It's their deduction, okay? You have no gross income, you have no deduction. Now guys, I'm not gonna test this because we're done with that, but always you're hearing reimbursement, refund, you should be thinking tax benefit rule, okay? Did I take a deduction last year and they're reimbursing me in the next year? Potentially, especially with moving expenses, you'd have to pull that into gross income because you took a benefit last year that you shouldn't have. You got reimbursed for it this year. So you should be thinking tax benefit rule when you're hearing reimbursement. I won't test it. Um, okay, guys, that's moving expenses, okay? Now, I just want to stop for a second and point out, okay, I talked in the beginning of class about using flashcards because this upcoming exam is going to be challenging, and I'm going to point out why, okay? We just covered one rule, and there's a million questions I can ask in here. I can ask you about the distance test. I can ask you about the time test. I can ask you who is paying for it? How is the reimbursement being handled? How are you gonna report it on your tax return? I can ask you some combination of this, okay? There's a million different ways, a million different things I could test within this one little rule, which is why I'm, again, fully encouraging flashcards, whatever it is that you have to do to kind of retain this. Each of these rules has a lot of little parts. So I'm just stressing to you, there's you know, 20 questions I can come up with in here easily, okay? Just trying to help you, not scary. Okay. Um, there was a homework question on this, guys. I'm not gonna go over it because most people have got it, no problem, so. Uh, but if you do have a question, you know, let me know. Okay, uh, another four AGI deduction, which is business related, or right, indirectly related to your business, is health insurance for self-employed taxpayers. So we're thinking of our sole proprietor and his Schedule C again, okay? He's his own boss here, okay? Look guys, we know that health insurance and the general employee, employer situation, okay? The employer can deduct it as a compensation expense and the employee is a tax-free friend, okay? He has no gross income for this. Now in the case of your sole proprietor, he can deduct these expenses, you know, any health insurance he provides for his employees on his Schedule C, and you'll see a little line on here for it, there's a health insurance line, okay? But in the eyes of the Internal Revenue Code, guys, he is not an employee, so he cannot deduct his own health insurance on his Schedule C, okay? He's not an employee, so he's not allowed to deduct any insurance he pays for himself on his Schedule C. It doesn't come out of his net profits. Now that would seem very unfair, right? Um, because in a normal employee employer situation, that is a deductible compensation expense. So to provide him with relief, some sort of equity, there's a special rule that says, okay, you can, Mr. Self-Employed Person, deduct the insurance costs for yourself, your spouse, your dependents, and they added now a child under the age of 27, okay, whether or not he's your dependent, you can deduct those health insurance costs as a four AGI deduction. Since we're not allowing you to do it here because you're not an employee, we're gonna allow you to do it as a four AGI deduction. 
and it's, uh, let's see, line number 29. I'm looking at a 2014 form, so I believe it's line 29, if you want to look. Again, guys, I'm not going to test you on line numbers. I just want you to appreciate the flow. Okay? So, initially, he's not allowed to take it as part of his Schedule C return, his business expense, but they do, in fact, give it to him on the face of the 1040. Um, but not so fast, okay, guys? He can't just blindly sort of take this entire deduction. There's two limitations, okay? They never just give anything away freely. Um, the first one says, look, if you're eligible to participate in an employer plan, maybe you also have a job, you know, as an employee somewhere, maybe your spouse works for an employer and they offer health insurance. If you are eligible to participate in a plan, then this exception, this deduction does not qualify for you, okay? And I don't care whether or not you chose to participate in the plan, as long as you're eligible, that's all that matters. So if you're eligible and turn it down and decide to buy your own insurance, well, you can't take this deduction, okay? That's one rule. The second rule says, look, you might have um, insurance that you bought, but you can only take it as a four AGI deduction up to the extent of the net profits of your uh, sole proprietorship, okay? So you would have to look at your Schedule C and figure out what's his profit. Well, my insurance costs can't exceed that amount and that I can take as a four AGI deduction. So simple sort of um, thing. Let's just say we have a taxpayer who has net profits on his Schedule C of $8,000. Now, he has self-insurance for him and his family of $12,000. Okay, guys? Ideally, what he'll do is he'll take $8,000 of it for HEI because that's the most, he's capped by that number. Okay? But all hope is not lost, okay? The rules also say that he can, in fact, take those insurance expenses down below the line, okay? He could, if he wanted to, take all $12,000 as a itemized deduction, medical deduction, okay? Again, you don't necessarily want to do that, though, because, right, we said our four AGI deductions are better, they're more beneficial. So what he would want to do is he'd want to use up every dollar he could as a four AGI deduction up to that profit amount. And then if he has a balance left over, then he can put that balance down below the line. And he may or may not qualify, may, may or may not be eligible to take that $4,000. That's going to depend on the separate rules when we get there. Okay. This goes on the bottom of the page. I was just trying to read that rule. Um, subject to certain restrictions, self employed tax rate to purchase health insurance with exchange, having household income below 400% of the poverty line. Where they come up with that? Um, I'm sure it's all sort of cost of living standards and things like that. I'm sure those numbers change every year. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's usually if you have to have at least $400 of income to file the form. If not, you don't have to. So I'm sure that's where that number is coming from. So don't, don't worry about that one. Um, okay, guys, so those are our two limitations in that case. This is the um, health insurance for the self-employed. Um, they get into the self-employed uh, taxes. Okay, we'll talk about it briefly here, but we're going to get into this in way more detail than you want when we get to Chapter 8 in taxing. So I'm not going to hit this too hard right now. Um, similar to the health insurance we just talked about, guys, um, a taxpayer who's self-employed has to pay uh, his payroll taxes. I've mentioned briefly before that there are um, federal payroll taxes. These are called the FICA taxes, and there's two components, Medicare and Social Security. Social Security is technically a 12.4% tax. But in a normal employee-employer situation, the employer pays half, the employee pays the other half out of their um, paycheck, okay? Medicare is the same, it's 2.9%, but it's generally split 1.45 each, okay? In a normal employee-employer situation, the employee, uh, employer deducts his half of the expenses as a compensation deduction, okay? And the employee pays the other half. But once again, okay, we have our sole proprietor, he's not, um, an employee again, okay? So they're saying, sorry, you can't deduct those costs on your Schedule C, okay? So he can't take his half of the deduction that he would otherwise take from his employees on here. So again, what they're saying is that, look, though, to give you equity, to treat you fairly as we would any other employer, you're allowed to deduct 
your half, the employer portion of those expenses as a four AGI deduction. We're gonna cover this in much, much more detail when we get to chapter eight, so that's really all I'm gonna say about it right now. So what'd you say the other one was Medicare? Social Security. That's 12.8. Medicare is uh, 12.4, Social Security is 2.9. Um, there's a savings penalty uh, on here. Um, guys, what this just really says is that there's certain types of accounts out there that say you have to commit your money for a certain period of time, okay? And they pay you interest for locking your money up. Um, and if you withdraw early, they're gonna hit you with a penalty, okay? This most traditionally comes in the form of certificates of deposits, which, you know, I have one, but probably not too many people have them anymore. Um, so, I mean, it would be something, you know, like you put $50,000 in an account and it gives you 1% interest, which I think is probably about what most things are paying nowadays. So, if you kept the money in for the full year, you would get $500, okay? But you need the money. You need to get that $50,000. So, you pull out early, okay? And instead, you're only going to get $450, okay? But on top of it, they say, we, you, you took the money out before a year, so we're going to slap you with a 10% penalty on that interest. So they're gonna charge you $45, okay? So in fact, you're only gonna get $405 worth of interest. Um, and without a special provision in the code, um, there's no sort of deduction for penalties, okay, in the code anywhere. So without this, it would say, you have to report $450 in interest. But the fact is, economically, you only receive $405. So here, they're saying, okay, you have to report this in gross income under your interest column. This becomes a four AGI deduction. There's a special provision just for that, okay? But don't, guys, on an exam, your answer isn't $405 in gross income, okay? Your answer is $450 of gross income, $45 deduction, four AGI deduction, okay? Don't, not know.
So it's going to be your college education. You want to go back and get your MBA. You want to go to law school. You want to go to medical school. Okay, it could be a vocational school, guys, with a degree or certificate at the end of it. Okay, it has to be after high school. Um, look, they include all sorts of things. You could take this money out. You might be paying for your tuition. You might be buying books. You might have to travel. Again, maybe you're going. You're sending your kid to California to go to school. Okay, that could cover the cost of his getting back and forth. Um, it includes his room and board, which is a rare exception in the Internal Revenue Code. They don't usually like to pay for room and board, okay? So if you take out loans and you pay interest on all these types of expenses, it's qualifying interest, okay? Um, so now our general rule says, okay, you can take this interest deduction. But again, stop because there's always a take back, there's always exceptions, okay? The first one says, look, you're limited to $2,500, okay? That's it, that's the most you can take. So you can take the actual amount you sp spent up to $2,500. So if you only spent $1,000 in interest, you only incurred $1,000 interest, that's all you can take, okay? If you spent $5,000 in interest, you could take $2,500. And on top of it, okay, so they put a cap on it, but then they also put in what's called a phase out, okay? This will be our first exposure to a phase out. And what this phase out basically says is that, look at your filing status. You're gonna look at, in this case, your modified AGI. If you make too much money in the eyes of the code, then we're gonna start to pull away this deduction slowly. And if you make just way too much money, we're gonna take it away altogether, okay? Um, now, for the interest deduction, watch it for both of them. Again, you start by looking at your filing status, okay? There's two different phase outs. If you're head of household or single, if you make somewhere in this range, the phase out is going to apply. Some percentage of this deduction is going to be taken away. I will go for an example. If you make less than this, if you have a modified AGI of only $50,000, guys, you don't have to worry about the phase out, okay? You can take the deduction to the lesser of you know, what you spent in interest or $2,500. If you make more than $80,000, no deduction, okay? You make too much money. Married, finally joint, it's got a different phase out. Okay, married filing separate, guys. Remember I told you about married filing separate, okay? They don't qualify for deduction, no deduction. And we're gonna see a lot of that, okay? So, just to give a little example, um, you have a single taxpayer, he has a modified AGI of $68,000, okay? And his $2,000 of qualifying interest expense. Here's how the phase out works. Okay, he's single, so you have to say to yourself, is he in that phase out range? He is, okay, he makes $68,000, so he falls in there. So what you do is you take your $68,000 minus the low end of the range, 65,000, okay? It's $3,000, divided by 15, where did I get the 15? It's the difference between 80 and 65, that's the range, okay? So 3,000 divided by 15, he has a 20% phase out. Now the rule says he could take the lesser of $2,500 or his actual amount of interest. In this case it was $2,000, that's the smaller of the two. That is the number you phase out, okay? So we're gonna phase out $20,000 times the 20%. $400 of his $2,000 possible deduction is taken away. He made a little bit too much money, so instead they're only gonna give him $1,600, okay? That's the way the phase out works for this. what was his actual expense versus what's that cap. You have to pick the smaller number, okay? And then you're looking to see how much is his modified AGI. And if, does he fall within the range? Did he make too much money? Is he under the range? Those are the first things you're really looking at. Okay? This is interest, guys. This is a percentage phase out. This is the more standard phase out that we're gonna keep seeing over and over again. We're gonna look at the qualified education expenses themselves now. So you went out and spent $50,000 on your education. This is now a different deduction, 
Okay, this is for the actual money you spent towards the education. Um, this one, right, I said you took out $50,000 of loan in the last scenario, and maybe you had a 10% interest rate, so your interest <coughs> might have been $5,000. Well, now you took out that $50,000 and you spent it this year, okay? But only the portion that you spent on tuition and fees is eligible. So maybe you took out 50, okay? You spent 25 on tuition, you spent the other 25,000 on room and board, you have to ignore that second $25,000. Room and board is not eligible for the deduction here. Only the tuition and fees, okay? So be careful there. Okay? The general rule says you could take up to four, a $4,000 deduction. The lesser of what you actually spent or $4,000. It's also subject to a fees out, which we'll look at in a second. $4,000 The actual education deduction itself. Interest, you can deduct up to $2,500, but for the actual education <coughs> expenses, you can deduct up to $4,000. Okay. Now this phase out is different, guys. This is a stepped phase out. So here we calculated a percentage. When it comes to the education deduction, it's a stepped phase out. So again, you have to look at your filing status, okay? Um, and then you have to look at the range. So the same range applies for this. So if you're single, you have to say, was I in the 65 to 80 range? Was I under it? Was I over it? Okay? If you're under the range, okay, you make $50,000 of modified AGI. Then you take the lesser of what you actually spent or $4,000. If you happen like this taxpayer here, you make $68,000 and you're right in that range somewhere then you only get the lesser of the actual amount you spent or $2,000 max. Okay? If you made too much money, you made $90,000, okay, you're not gonna get a deduction. Married filing separate, no deduction. Okay, this is a step phase out. It's a little different. She's a dependent, she's going to college, 
I can take that deduction, okay? I'm paying the expense, she's my dependent, I'm entitled to the deduction. Now, if my daughter is not my dependent and she's um, paying her own expense and she's her own dependent, obviously she's gonna get it, okay? If she's my dependent, but I said, I'm not paying for your education, you're on your own, kiddo, okay? No one gets the deduction. She doesn't get it, I don't get it. She's my dependent, she lives in my house, I'm supporting her, but I'm not providing her education, okay? She's paying for her own expenses. Well, it's not my expense, so it's not my deduction. She doesn't get a, uh, she's not her own dependent, so she's not entitled to the deduction either, okay? She's my dependent. So you have to know who's paying the expense. Um, there's a more obscure rule that says, look, there may be a third taxpayer who's paying this child's expense. So she's my daughter, she's living with me, she's my dependent, okay? Maybe grandma and grandpa come along and say, hey, we wanna pay for your college education. In that case, it's gonna work, okay? Because their code is gonna say, grandma and grandpa paying that education is a gift, okay? She's gonna have income, and in that case, she would be entitled to that expense, the deduction. Okay, so just go back and look at those rules. It matters who's paying for the educational expenses. That's like the, the, the deduction for this, for the education expense, it's still active? Yes. So this doesn't belong to set to expire after 2000. They all say that because a lot of these things um, are all set to expire. They almost always renew them, like on the last day of the year. Um, there's a lot of things that we'll study that we'll keep going that are set to expire. Um, but they'll, 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 they want education. Um, so, if that third taxpayer pays for the education, who gets the deduction? The child. The child. That'll work in that case. Okay, guys. So let's um, look at problem number 41 in your book. I think this was a homework <coughs> problem, but not a highly successful one. So. Subject to the percentage phase out for the interest deduction. 
Okay? Again, same calculation. You take his modified AGI as the starting point, minus the bottom of the range, okay? That gives you $9,000. Then you divide it by $15,000, which is, again, the difference between 80 and 65. If it was married, a married family joint situation, guys, your uh, denominator would be $30,000, okay? Um, that gives you a 60% phase out. Here, he's entitled to the lesser of 1440 or $2,500. So 1440 is our working point. Okay, 1440 times the 60% phase out means of the 1440 he was initially eligible for, we have to take away 864. Only the $576 qualifies. Okay, so he's gonna take that, the $576, as a four AGI deduction on his 1040. Now the point I was making about the modified AGI guys is, look, at this point in time, we know what that number is, okay? We know what his deduction is here. So we would go back to our modified AGI and plug that number in, okay? This problem told us his uh, modified AGI was initially $74,000 before either of the deductions. Well, we now know what his interest deduction is, so we have to alter the modified AGI number, right? It becomes, $73,424 instead. That is your starting point for the education deduction, okay? You don't want to just stick with that number. Following? Okay. In this case, it's not gonna matter because he's still gonna be in the range. But it could matter, guys. It could push him down below, okay? So be careful. Okay, so now we're gonna do education. You know, his new modified AGI, okay? This is a stepped phase out. Please, when you get to the exam, guys, don't just try and do both of them as percentages, okay? This one's a stepped phase out. He's in the range, and our rules say for this that if he's in the range, he gets the lesser of the actual amount of education expenses he spent, or $2,000, okay? So he spent $24,000 or $2,000. $2,000 is gonna make his deduction, okay? Good guys. Okay. Modified AGI ninety thousand dollars. What happens? No deduction, right? You made too much money. As soon as he goes over this, the entire deduction is taken away. You made too much money. We're going to take it all away. He's not going to get any interest deduction or any education deduction in that case. Okay. Those are four AGI deductions. We're gonna circle back, like I said, to IRAs, so we're gonna add one more to the list um, next week. But those are generally your four AGI deductions. If you have questions, let me know. Okay, um, now we're gonna to go to from AGI deductions. Okay guys, we have two sets of from AGI below the line deductions, okay? The first one is we have the creator of our itemized deductions or our standard deductions, the greater of the two. Then we have any personal and dependency exemptions. Those are our second set of below the line deductions. Our itemized deductions, guys, you're turning to your Schedule A. This is where you're gonna work out your itemized deductions. They're all gonna be found right here on the Schedule A. Again, I encourage you to mark this up, write limits, percentages, whatever you need to on here, okay? Again, Below the line, guys, primarily, it's gonna be investment and personal related expenses, okay? Most of these are given, guys, in the case to alleviate certain hardships, okay? In the case of maybe like casualty and theft losses, medical expenses, because these um, taxpayers have incurred expenses involuntarily, um, so they might allow you a deduction in certain cases, or because they're encouraging us to engage in certain behaviors, charitable contributions. You know, they want us to buy homes, so there's some mortgage interest deductions on here, okay? Certain things they want us to do as taxpayers. Okay, our first expense is medical. We'll start this. You know what, guys? I'm going to call it right here. I think I'll